You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Those of you who watch Newsmakers on a regular basis know that I try to invite people who move here to take leadership of important institutions to join me. For over a century, the Art Museum in Eden Park has brought Cincinnatians in contact with paintings, sculptures, prints, and photos that have defined and redefined the way we look at what it means to be human. In the early 1880s, Cincinnati's most prominent citizens raised the funds to design and build an art museum worthy of a city that liked to call itself the Paris of America. The original art museum that opened in 1886 was a grand Romanesque structure crowning an Eden Park Hill overlooking downtown Cincinnati. Inside, visitors were greeted by a grand hall filled with plaster copies of famous classical sculptures. In the years that followed, the collections grew and so did the need for space. New wings, each in a different architectural style, sprang up topsy-turvy. Ultimately, everything from neoclassical to nondescript to sterile modern additions buried the dignity of the original building. The Cincinnati Art Museum stands as a strong regional facility that attracts over a quarter of a million visitors each year. On any weekday, volunteer docents can be discovered in the galleries introducing classes of young people and adults to the art and artists. It is in these galleries that adults are reminded and children first realize in many cases just how many different ways there are to look at our experience as human beings. Less than three months ago, Timothy Rubb became only the eighth director of the Cincinnati Art Museum. Before coming to Cincinnati, he served as the director of the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. Before that, as a curator at the Cooper Hewitt Museum. Timothy, welcome to Newsmakers and welcome to Cincinnati. Thank you, Dan. I'm delighted to be here. The Hood Museum, Dartmouth College, out in the woods, as folks from Dartmouth say, why come to Cincinnati? What is it that intrigues you about the opportunity with the Cincinnati Art Museum? Well, I think as you know, the Art Museum is an extraordinary institution. It has one of the finest collections in this country, and it serves a great, great city. Cincinnati is a wonderful place in terms of arts and cultures. It always has been, and I think it has a very bright future in that regard. You know, what is the reputation of the Cincinnati Art Museum in the profession for people who, you know, you were at the hood before you began to seriously look at that. What did you know about, about this institution? When you said it's a great collection, what, what is seen as the strengths here? Well, it, as you know, it's a general museum, so it has many different strengths. And of course, it collection, its collection covers nearly 6,000 years of, of human history and creative achievement. So as a general museum, it is well known and highly regarded with strengths from uh, Egyptian art all the way up to to the art of the present day. It's always been known for its superb collection of old master European paintings. I think its American paintings are equally strong, but they're not as well known. And it always has, has been highly regarded for its collection of works on paper, prints, drawings, and photographs. So there's a lot to work with here. Okay, the General Museum, it really does yeah. define it in the, in the world of museums. It, it's different than some other places. It, it, exactly. Um, you know, not just this museum, but all art museums, all museums really, but all art museums, there's a certain, uh, certain fear, I think. There's, a, there's almost treated as sacred spaces, and sometimes people don't feel like they know enough mm -hmm. or they are confident enough to cross that, that threshold. Um, what can an art museum do to try to invite people in? What is it that the Cincinnati Art Museum can do, and what, what would you like to see it do? A number of things, but let me first say that, you know, paradoxically, today museums are attracting more visitors than ever before. Uh, there may be barriers yet to overcome, but we're, we're making progress. And across this country, in Cincinnati, in New York, in many different places, museums are again bringing all, all members of the community in, lots of good feeling about them. In, in terms of what we can do, I, I think we need to really capitalize on some of our assets. Again, tell people about this wonderful collection we have. Use it in more creative ways. Uh, make sure that people understand that it is a very rich and almost a renewable resource for the community. Secondly, uh, 
it's a great location. Um, when I was speaking to a few people the other day, I suggested that if we had no museum in the city and we asked people where a great museum should be located, they would pick this location Eden, in Eden Park on this wonderful hill overlooking the downtown. It's a great destination point and we have to make it sing and really shine in every way we can. You know, uh, that point about where it is, I think sometimes when you look at like those early prints that I was using in that little background yeah. piece, uh, you realize that in the 1880s that hillside wasn't grown up with all the trees that it is now. And you could not only see when you were on top looking down at the city, but you could see the museum itself even better right. in the 1880s. And, you know, but that, that really is. It's this wonderful location. When you say, uh, you know, more opportunities to get people inside, one of the things that you're going to be doing, in fact, opening today, is an exhibit on that, that covers the scope of African-American painting and, and art in the United States. Is that the sort of thing? Is that the way to invite maybe new audiences in? Absolutely. I think one of the keys is a diverse exhibitions program. The community and all parts of the community needs to see itself reflected in what the museum does, not only in our collection, but also in terms of the special exhibitions we present and the kind of programming we do um, for children, for adults, giving them an opportunity to engage the art in ways that, that are comfortable for them. What are some of the most creative things that are not necessarily being done at your place, but being done at other museums that you really think maybe you could learn from to, to help people engage, to help people get over that, gee, I don't know what to say when I look at a sculpture or I look at a painting. What, what, and, and not so much for children. What about adults? What, can you, what are museums doing to help with that? Well, I, one of the things that I'm really interested in is asking when people have time to come to the museum. Museums are open, say, traditionally from 10 to 5 during the day. Are you missing opportunities to engage a community that can only come um, in the evening? Are you inviting people to come by themselves, to come with others? Are you giving them opportunities for, for, for groups to come in? People that they know, that they might want to spend time with, uh, and making the museum a place, available as a place that they can, they can interact with each other and uh, obviously with the art. You know, one of the ways that museums have always, and I'm sure always will, it, to get people to come in, maybe new people, is to, to mount a special exhibit, yeah. either something the museum puts together itself or maybe something that's a traveling exhibit and you book mm -hmm. it in. Uh, what's your view about the role of special exhibits like that and anything coming up that you really you know, would like to alert people to? Oh, there are lots of things. Uh, l let me first say that Interestingly, if you look at surveys of museum visitors, in most cases at least half the people coming through the door of a museum are coming to see the museum itself and its own collection. Special mm -hmm. exhibitions are important and they're very important in engaging new audiences, um, giving people a reason to come back as well. But we will always have to think about striking a balance between what we have, which again I want to stress is really really wonderful uh, and what we can do uh, in terms of special exhibitions. Now we have a, a number of wonderful shows coming up over the next year. I think one of the, the, the very finest and most exciting will be a great show of European painting from the early 15th century all the way up to the 20th century. Picasso, David Hockney, uh, Rembrandt, all of the great names of European art coming from Australia from one of the leading collections, the Nas National Gallery of Victoria, and that will open um, this October at the museum and we will be the, the first venue uh, to which this collection travels in this country and it's going to be a great occasion. Uh, next year we're going to do uh, a show of promised gifts from collections in Cincinnati to celebrate the millennium. You know one of the things about special exhibits, uh, especially sometimes traveling exhibits, a lot of museums have mounted, uh, displayed exhibits that have had a controversial element to them. I mean, in Cincinnati, the mm -hmm. Maplethorpe exhibit at the Contemporary Art Center, or the Brooklyn Art Museum mm -hmm. uh, with the Sensations exhibit. Uh, Cincinnati is known, uh, maybe you haven't heard this, <laughs> as a conservative place. What's the role of bringing in the unexpected, the non-European tradition, the something that puts people on edge a little bit. What, what's the role of the museum there? I think it's always important to remember that art as a fundamental human expression is going to cover a range of subjects. 
and touch people in different ways. Sometimes it will be seductive and charming and full of joy. Uh, other times, as, as great literature does, or great theater, it will deal with very tough, deep, but difficult human issues. And we can't shy away from that. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. At the same time, we have to recognize we have a responsibility to the community um, to, to present things that won't cause division, harm, ill feelings, um, won't unnecessarily raise, raise the hackles of the community in the way that divides it rather than brings it together. That doesn't mean we can't show art that's difficult, that's hard hitting, that again um, really touches upon what do you think what about the Brooklyn Art Museum's decision to present that particular show, the one that caused so much uproar? I respect the judgment of, of the director of the museum. Could I, you imagine it in Cincinnati? I don't think I could. And I, but more importantly, I don't think that if we, if we chose to show contemporary British work, that we, we, we would do so in such a way. There are many other issues surrounding the decision to present that show that, um, that are, I think were, were issues that needed to be questioned publicly. Uh, on the other hand. For example? How it was funded. Um, public funding? Public, well, not public funding, but the, the relationship between the, the, um, the collector and the, the show itself, um, the way it was marketed and the like. Um, clearly, they were intended for good purposes, to bring the public in to engage them with this art. Uh, whether it actually turned out that way, as the way it was intended, is another issue entirely. What about the question of public funding? There's always a lot of, well, not always. There has been in recent years a number of major brouhaha's about the, NE, the NEA, the National mm -hmm. Endowment for the Arts, uh, funding exhibits that are hard and controversial. What do you believe is the right role for the NEA? I, and do you believe that the NEA does have a role, that federal funding does have a role in an institution like yours? I believe it does. And if you look back over the history of the NEA and of, of public arts funding in this country, um, I think the, the proof is that the benefits have been overwhelmingly good for, for institutions and for the communities they serve. When you look at the scope of projects uh, and functions that the NEA funds, uh, from conservation to education programs to uh, collection storage to the building of new buildings and rehabilitation of wings. A lot of things that people never hear about. Yeah, you know, the vast majority, 99 plus percent of, of all of those grants are uncontroversial. They go towards, uh, to the heart of the issue. That is, how can the arts better serve uh, and institutions better serve the communities um, they're in? And I think the NEA has played a very important role. The other thing to keep in mind that for the amount of, of money that the NEA or the NEH for that matter um, give every year to institutions and communities across this country, that sum is dwarfed by um, public support of another kind from individuals, from the communities themselves, from corporations that see the funding of the arts as critical to the cultural life of their communities, to the quality of life indeed. So the, in our community, the Fine <coughs> Arts Fund uh, a major source, but also individual gifts and endowment building and that sort of thing. Indeed, let me come back to the point that I think this is a remarkable community in terms of, of what it has to offer its, its citizens, but the kind of support that they show also for the arts. Uh, the Fine Arts Fund is, is, is an exceptional organization, but, but beyond that, the number of members that the museum has. How big? We have over 12,000 members, um, and we will grow that number in the future, but that's an exceptional number to begin with. Now, I know you've only been in town for less than three months uh, on a full-time basis. Um, any sense of the museum community as a whole here? I mean, out on the, the perimeter or the periphery there, uh, the horizon, we've got the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center that's moving towards development. We've got a contemporary arts, a new contemporary arts center. It's talking uh, that's going to build a new building. Um, how would you evaluate not just your institution, but the museum cultural community in general in this town? It, it's as strong as you'd find in any city of this size in this country. In fact, much stronger. A great group of institutions. Clearly, they fill different niches very well. The CAC is a wonderful organization doing great work with great plans for the future. The Taft is a jewel. 
Uh, yeah. Beautiful building, beautiful collection. Um, tells the story of a family and the history of Cincinnati in, in, the, in a way that we can't, can't at the museum. And then the museum itself, which is an extraordinary resource, being the general art museum, the largest, lots of good things. You know, over the, uh, oh, I don't know, year and a half or last two, year and a half, two years, uh, there was a process to go on, going on called the Regional Cultural Planning Committee or Association, whatever, RCPC, whatever it was, but tr trying to develop a regional cultural plan, a re regional cultural plan and a regional cultural association. That report was finished about 10 months ago. Nothing, the next step hasn't been taken. What do you see in terms of cooperation, active cooperation, not just everybody shaking hands and smiling mm -hmm. at each other, active cooperation. Can you see interrelationships, interagency uh, programming between the Art Museum and other institutions in our area? Not only can I see it happening, I think it's really a key for the future. Um, you know, it's important for Cincinnati and the region to have taken the step to look at, at how the city will relate to, to other parts of the region and what we'll be doing together. Uh, there's no doubt that in the future partnerships and partnerships that benefit both partners, the museum, the CAC, the museum, the symphony, the museum and many organizations in northern Kentucky, in the outer, uh, outlying counties, it's going to be critical for the future of Cincinnati and for the region. And in this regard, I think the museum, the symphony, the major arts organizations here need to take a leadership role. What about the CAC specifically, the Contemporary Arts Center? Um, I guess some people worry that gee, it's a, it's a closed world and you put a lot of new resources into one place, you just take them from someplace else. How do you view the building of an expanded, new, fresh contemporary art center? How will that impact you? How do you th think it will impact the community? I think it will be great for everyone, not only the CAC, but the museum and the community. Uh, it, it represents a major step forward and a long overdue one for the CAC. It's an ambitious and wonderful design. And it's going to focus a lot of attention on Cincinnati. All of those things will be good, not only for the CAC, but for everyone. No doubt about it. What about new technologies? You know, the web. Yeah. When we can log on and I can yeah. see images from the Met or the Guggenheim and on the web or from your place. Do I need to go to New York anymore? Do I need to, go, to come to the Art Museum? What, what, how do you see the web? Or other technologies, let me put it that way. Well, two fundamental things to keep in mind. Um, if, you want to, if you want to engage the community, which we do, um, it's always going to be with the goal of bringing the community back to the museum and into the museum and making it more accessible. Now, having said that, technology is an extraordinarily powerful tool to make the museum just that, more accessible. If people know what we have, if they have more immediate access to information about who we are, what we do, what we're doing tomorrow, what we're doing next year, uh, it's going to make it easier for us to persuade them to come uh, up the hill. We have to go down to the hill to bring them back up. And I think we've just, we're just at the beginning of, of a really interesting time for museums in that regard. Do you have people at your institution actively working on your website? We have a great website. Um, I know you have a great website, but we is, do. It, is it something that's growing? Is it something that's it's, changing? It's something that's, that's growing and growing by leaps and bounds. We've just completed a wonderful new redesign, and we're only in phase one. We're going to be adding more functions to that over time, and I think it's, it, there's tremendous opportunity there. Now, let me ask, say one other point. Okay, go ahead, real quick. And, and that is that uh, seeing a picture on the web or in, in a book never stop people from coming to the museum. In fact, it encourage them to do so. Okay. I think that's a truism that all of us yeah. in the museum world know. Thank you. Welcome to Cincinnati. Hope you can come back and we can keep talking about this in the future as your institution continues to evolve. Thanks, Dan. I'm okay. delighted to be here. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll take a look at some of the people who were brimming with energy on election night 10 days ago and meet one of the area's youngest new candidates who faces a big challenge. Welcome back. Last week I decided in the middle of the program to keep Police Chief Tom Stryker and Keith Borders for the entire show. 
That meant the guest I had scheduled for the second half of the show was squeezed out, something I didn't want to do to a young man who has decided to enter the political arena. After the show, we taped the interview. Here it is. Mr. Cranley completed his law degree at Harvard last spring and is completing a master's at the Harvard Divinity School this spring. John is a graduate of St. Xavier High School. He now lives in Price Hill, where he also grew up. John, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Thank you for having me. John, uh, politics, a lot of people I hear say, gee, why would anybody want to get involved? Why do you want to get involved? Well, I think in this case to your, your question regarding cynicism, uh, you know, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm from Price Hill. and Cincinnati, I think, is in a unique situation because we have, unlike any other city in the country, connections and networks of people. No other place in the country can you go that people still remember, and most important, where you went to grade school and where you went to high school. And we're all still and if together. you're from the west side, what parish <laughs> you're from, right? <laughs> yeah, like St. William. St. Exactly. William, right. Okay, exactly. go ahead. So I think that, you know, this is some of the things that some of the presidential candidates have tapped into, like McCain and some others. We want to move beyond looking at self-interest. And because in Cincinnati, our relationships are not ordinary, our ability to work together to improve the city and our country's future is extraordinary. And I think that we stand right now at the opportunity to, we're going to focus on higher values. For example, talk to me how, concretely, how does that translate? Well, I think it translates to saying in a democracy that we can come together and take control of our lives. For example, we can say that work should pay. We should say that simply that if you're a working family in this country, you should have opportunity to good education, decent health care, opportunities to go to college, and that we need to come together and say, this is our higher value. This is our new moral vision, and we are going to work together to make it happen. Well, let's talk about those. Okay. I mean, the, the, the thing is, uh, government has to translate principles into action. Right. What's that mean on the federal level for people who have a right to good education? What, what would you propose? Well, I think, I think as a general rule, I think we have to do, think of two things. One is, whenever possible, have local control of implementing plans. But, we, but to act as though we can't have a federal commitment, I think, is, is, is foolhardy. And, and I'll tell you why, because everyone in this country right now recognizes that education is our biggest crisis, okay? And most school districts in this country being funded by property taxes are already pretty much at the maximum. We have federal dollars that can go to, to education, and I think we need to put them there and then have local control. At the moment, about, if I understand correctly, about 1% of the total education budget for elementary and high school level in this country comes from federal dollars. Right. Would, would you be proposing a significant increase in that? No, I think that, I think a couple of things. I think, first of all, the most, the most sub substantive way that the federal government can make a commitment to education is doing things like Head Start. You know, that's one of the things, again, that we want to, as a, 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 one of the focuses of my campaign, is say that we should always be our brother and our sister's okay. keeper. So, Education targeted because of limited resources, right. locally controlled. That's right. What about health? That's a that's a major issue right now. That's what would right. you propose on that? Well, I think I think that one of the things about, as you know, is that ours is a sort of youthful youthful campaign, and I think that one of the things that our youthful vigor can do is give new meaning to taking care of the people that raised us. Concretely, I think we need to look at at, at extending coverage for prescri prescription drugs for for the elderly. I think we got to make sure that we we keep Medicare fully funded. I think we've got to figure out a way to make sure Medicaid is fully funded. Um, and then on top of that, we've got to look for new ways to deal with this prescription drug crisis. Okay. One last question, and sure. we're going to be talking to you again okay. through the fall. And I, but, thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, Steve Shabbat, yeah. he's not a newcomer. He's pretty right. solid. What's it going to take to win this race? I think it's going to take a lot of energy. Uh, the, the congressman's a very nice guy, and he works his district hard, and my job is to work just as hard as he does to to make inroads where, and on the west side where I'm from, to reach out to over the Rhine, to reach out to the north side. And I think that with, you know, with all of our energy and, and, and opportunity that we can go out there and present a new vision that isn't focused on his ideology, which is we can't do this, we can't do that, no, no, no. Our, our opportunity is going to be we are extraordinary in this community and we can't have higher values that we're committed to. John, thanks for being here this morning. Good luck. Next time you're here, you'll be here with Steve. Thank you. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We end this morning with some views of the pieces from the narratives of African American art and identity that opens at the, public, uh, at the art museum today to the public.